Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actress Barca Madan and musician Sean Lee. Actress and former beauty queen Barca Madan was born in Kota, Rajasthan, but raised all over India because her father was in the Indian Army. The armed forces had a school on all the bases called Central School, which she attended and then went on to college in New Delhi. She graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in English, as well as taking honors in the <laughs> with all of, all of your work, right? That's right. Yeah, you graduated with top honors. Since 1999, when she left the beauty pageant scene, uh, she started a television career. That's right. <laughs> How did you do that? How did you get from beauty pageant to television? I think it was a very natural progression for me because once you are there, out there modeling and stuff, you are in the public eye and uh, I was always doing dramatics in college and this was like very natural, you know. You did do out. dramatics in college? Oh, yes, I did. Because when you're studying literature, I was studying literature in college and you know, you're exposed to Shakespeare, you're exposed to all kind of poetry oh. and drama. Uh, so it was like always there, but I had never thought of doing a career in acting. But when this opportunity came across, I was like, why not? When you were in the beauty pageant scene, mm -hmm. was it before college or after? It was during college. It was during? Yes. So what did you have to do? How did you prepare? What kind of lifestyle was that? Well, for modeling and for this beauty pageant, it was uh, completely a different lifestyle than what I had been exposed to. My father being in the army, we were like very regimented mm. and you know, always like traveling with him and we had a very sort of uh, routine life. But this was like all glamour and pretty makeup, <laughs> lovely clothes and so many people, parties. It was a different lifestyle for me altogether. Did all the girls travel together? Oh yes, we you all just traveled together. And were you good friends? Yeah, I am still friends with most of them. Really? <laughs> yes. What, what's, what did they go into? What other careers did they go well, into? Well, some of them are still modeling. A uh, few of them have their own television shows. Oh. And some of them are acting like me. They yeah. are. Yes. So it was a great lifestyle to step into acting. Yes, it is. Great. How did you keep in shape? I work out. I do yoga. You do? Yes. When um, you were in the beauty pageant, how did you keep in shape then? Same thing? Uh, you know, I was an athlete in, in college. Uh. So this was like uh, very easy for me because, and also coming from the arm background, you know, it's very easy to be fit. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, continue studying acting? Uh, yes, I do a lot of theater. Do you? Yes. Well, one of the things, you do this tier, uh, TV series called Garik Sapa. Karik Sapna. Sapna, that's right. Tell us a little bit about that. What kind of role do you have in that? Well, in Karik Sapna, I was playing the role of uh, this lady who her only ambition is to get married. <laughs> and she is not able to find it because this is a very big thing in Indian society, you know. Like women should get married at a certain age and everything. And she is reaching in her 30s and, you know, she's panicking. I'm not finding a spouse for myself. And uh, then she ends up having a relationship with a younger man which is not very acceptable in a society again. That's what I wondered, yeah. Yes. And so it was, it was a very challenging and diabolical role for me. And then she gets into alcoholism. And how many, seri how many uh, uh, parts to the series? Oh, well, no, it was a, a soap opera. Oh, it was a soap opera, so it was ongoing. Yes, it um, went on for two and a half years. Oh, <laughs> yes. So you got into a lot of trouble. I did so. <laughs> I did so. I mean, they would say, oh yeah, she's in a relationship again. She's going to come and suicide one more time. Or at least attempt to be. I'm like, oh my God. A difficult role for me because completely opposite to my personality. Yeah, they would say, I'm a Reiki practitioner. Oh, you are? Yes. So I you practice. go like this? Yes, I practice You put your hands <laughs> Reiki like this, is it? Yes, like this. How do you train for that? Um, I was in, in Bombay and it was it was like a call Mumbai right now. Uh, it was a coincidence actually. 
So now I believe nothing is a coincidence really. You know, I was dancing and I kind of twisted my leg and uh, the instructor out there was like, can I help you? I was like, okay. And she put her hands on my ankle and I was walking in like 15, 20 minutes. And it just felt wonderful. It you felt could warm. feel it. Yes. It felt so warm and so good. And I was like, what did you do? And that pulled me into it. Ah, so then you have to study that? Yes, I studied that. <laughs> well, now we're getting all the sides <laughs> of Barca. You, play, you were in another series, Mira Hamsafar? Yes, Mira Hamsafar. What is that? Uh, I what was, role was that? Oh, I was playing a mother to um, a child who was suffering from Down syndrome. Really? Yes. All the roles that I've done so far are, you know, very different and distinct from each other. So her, her, her husband abandons her because, you know, he does not want to accept the baby. And she's like, um, anything else could have happened to this baby later. You know, like, how, how can you abandon your baby? Right, right. And so it was, again, a very challenging role for me. One of the things that you love to do, I, I read this, that you love these historical series and female warrior types, oh, which is also yes. different too, oh, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Uh, there was this show called 1857, The Mutiny. Uh, this was the first war of independence India had against uh. the British rule. Um, and I was playing the Queen of Chasi in that. She was very strong. Yes, very strong. The only warrior, female warrior at that time. And she stood up against the... The British Empire. Mm. And yes. so... Was that far along in your career? Are we getting further and further into your career now, playing yes. the warrior? <laughs> Are we leading up to the production company? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm like all charging towards it. <laughs> well, one of the films uh, was with a Dutch company. It was called Driving Miss Parman. Uh, it was the first Indo-Dutch production. Oh, that was the first? Yes, it was. Uh, actually, I would say Really, was... Indo-Dutch? Mm -hmm. It was a crossover in the truest sense. Um, they had write, uh, the writers coming down from Holland and they had this very oh. unique script and they wanted Indian actors to play the real parts. So we have like real names. I was playing Tracy Emin. Oh, is that right? Yes. Her name is that right? She's English. She's in my name. And she's a painter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she's known for her crazy art, you know. And when they gave me her profile, I was like, are you sure? She's selling tampons. Oh, can I say it on TV? <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Oh, yeah, because she worked with, in the arts with that. Yes. So uh, I was like, she's a bizarre character. It's like, but, well, we have you for that. So Did you meet her? Because uh, she's alive. Yes, I know, but I haven't had a chance to meet her. But I was told that she saw the movie when it was aired. It was, they had like an open screening uh -huh. uh, at the open theater at Damien Square in Amsterdam. And um, she kind of uh, sent a comment like, this was not bad. <laughs> <laughs> she's not the type who would want to see herself on screen anyway. I'm I think sure. she just likes to be in the museum and right. the galleries right. and the, in her studio. Right. That's very funny. Um, you started a company called Golden Gate. Um, the Golden Gate Creations. Golden Gate Creations, that's right. Yeah. Why did you start a, a, is it a production company? It's a production and distribution company now. Uh, well, the main aim of starting this was uh, we have a lot of films in India which are not studio based. Oh, you know, which is your film that My you did? Film. It's not stu studio. No, it's oh, an independent film. I see. You know, and uh, you have seen the film. Yes. And I'll it's all on location. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Right. Oh, so that's why you started it? Yes, yeah, that was the motivation behind it, and I was like, uh, we need to promote this kind of talent. And it's story driven? Absolutely. You know, I always say content is the king. You know, if you have a good story, you have a great location, you have a good team put together, you can damn well put a good product out there. Who did you start the company with? My partner is Vivek Kumar. Uh, he's here from LA. Uh, he's basically a CPA in the day job. And, uh, oh, that's Jesus' day job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he, he's a writer from UCLA, he's a screenwriter. Uh, so the production that we're going into is our own production. He has written the script for it. And and the name of the film? Uh, the film of the, which is coming the, out on 27th. Yes, it's yes. called Sochlo. Sochlo. That's right. And what does that mean? It means think <laughs> about it. Okay. <laughs> what are we supposed to think about? Well, it is about arranged marriages. And, uh, you know, in India, 90% of people are marrying that way. I mean, your, your parents arrange a marriage for you. You go meet your spouse or maybe not and you end up spending your life with the person. 
But this is not really going very well with the youth right now. You know, you're so much more exposed to the world right now. Right. You know, there is so much more globalization happening. And the youths today want to experiment. So yeah. was this set today, the film? Was it set in today's yes, world? Yes, it is. And it is, it is a film which talks about rural India and the modern India. So yeah. you've got this yes. uh, two situations yes. that are weighing against right. each other. Where did you shoot? We shot this film in Rajasthan, in Jaisalmer. We have like beautiful desert location there. And also in a place called Ganpati Phule. Um, that's the coastal land. It's beautiful oh, beaches. Oh, the coast, yeah. Yes. What is that called again? Ganpati Phule. Uh, that's in Maharashtra. Yeah. It's beautiful. Who, who uh, directed it? Uh, Sartat Singh Pannu. Uh, he's a leading man too in the film. He writ he's written the script and uh, he's the director and the actor. He is fantastic. Is yes. he a big star in India? This is his first film? No. Yes. He is fantastic. This is his first film. And yes. the way that he used the camera in right. tight shots and right. wide shots and you got the feeling of, of, of what was going on. Absolutely. You won't believe it, you know. It's a first film for most of the people in the crew too. And uh, they are from this institution called FTII which is uh, Films and Television Institute of India. Ah, and what attracted you to the role? Um, There's two women in it. Yes. The, uh, the arranged marriage. Yes, and the one who refuses it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder um, who you are. Yeah, the one who refuses <laughs> it. <laughs> because you love to play strong women. <laughs> That's right. Um, two things attracted me to this script. Uh, first was the character. I thought it was very well written and the narrative of the story. It was not a linear pattern. It went back and forth, you know. Oh, yes. I found it very interesting. And secondly, this film has been put together by a whole lot of French, fresh talent, you know. So I was like, uh -huh. I want to work with these people. They have a lot of energy. It's very interesting. With a, how long did it take you to shoot the film? About 25 days. Well, that's not too bad. Yes. Was it hot where you were in the... <laughs> Extremely hot and extremely cold. Was it? Yes. And uh, we had shot. We had shot this film like in daytime, you know, in daylight. So we would begin seven in the morning and finish at seven in the evening. So. And it was just getting dark, or was it still daylight at seven? Uh, daylight. It starts getting dark about uh, six thirty in, oh, in the day. Yes, yes. So you had this nice light. Right. But we have to wake up like four in the morning to be at the location at seven. It was like tough. One of the things that I thought was so beautiful was the music. Oh, yes. Tell me about the music. It's composed by this person called Nitish Paris. Uh, he, he has his, uh, a rock band in India, oh. which is the first Hindi rock band. So Most, this is the first two. Yes, yes. In India, we have had a lot of English rock bands. You know, This is the first Hindi language rock band. And when he composed this music, we were like, this is fantastic. This is his first, first film, too. So that's great. Um, when we talk about your company, mm -hmm. would you use Hollywood? Would you use American actors oh, yes. in your films? Oh, yes. In fact, my upcoming project, it's a very global film. You know, It has got a very global script. And I, w I love to merge people. I watch just Hollywood, you know, actors from elsewhere, too. D will you? Yes. Will they Yes, definitely. Because I wondered if that's why you came to Hollywood to start your, com or did you start your company here? That's right. Uh, one of the main reasons is to club the talent, you know, to have a good marriage from the East and here. Well, I hope you have a good marriage, even though it's arranged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Nice to have you. Thank you, um, Thank Barca. you so much for calling me for the show. And don't go away. We'll be back with musician Sean Lee. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with musician Sean Lee, who grew up in the Midwest. He found his musical talent at the local Baptist church, where he sang and played drums with the gospel choir. He played in the local band called Lotus, which nurtured superstar Martina McBride. Mm. Um, <laughs> she's huge, 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 huge singer. Did you know it at the time? That's a funny question because, yeah, she was, was a really good singer back then and I always thought, you know, 
I actually sort of encouraged her to sing country because she was trying to do rock. I was going to ask you, was she a country singer? She, she, her dad and her mom had a band. They had a family band. Oh. And uh, they, her last name is Schiff. And that uh, was before she got married. And they were called the, uh, the Shifters. <laughs> <laughs> Long from Lotus, what was that? Where did that name come from? That's a good question. It's, all, it's still together. It's a band that's been together since the 70s. You're kidding. It's still yeah. together? And you yeah. played in it? Yeah, I played in it. With has it Martina. just changed and changed and changed? It has done. There's like more musicians in that than there's been presidents of the United States. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, why didn't you stay on with her if you thought she was good? Could you have well, done something? Well, it's funny, you know, we were in the band, at the same, uh, I was in the band before her, then we were, we were in there for about a year and a half together, and um, after that, I sort of moved to L.A., uh, and shortly, about six months later, she moved to uh, Nashville. Oh, I see. So you just went your way? Uh, she, she had married this guy that was a sound guy for Garth Brooks, Oh. and, uh, you know, you know, straight away she was the opening act for Garth Brooks, and then she just went mega. This is what we talk about: how your, your field has so much talent, but it's really who you know, isn't it? Completely. I think uh, you, you never really know who's going to make it and who's not going to make it. The amount of talented people I've come across over the years, and you think uh, this guy, this girl, she, they've got it all. You know, they they look great. They you know, they're very talented, they write, they sing great, you know, they got the look. It's like, you know, they have everything at their disposal. And? and most of them never make it, you know. And why? Did they learn out in the right place at the right time? That's why. I, I could have never predicted that Martina was going to be you know, humongous. You know, I, she was great. And it, we used to have, like, band meetings about her, saying, you know, she, she's like, you know, she's lazy, she's not doing a thing, you know. And, uh, and then she just went mega, you know. And I knew, like, Vince Vaughn, before he was famous, I could, could never have predicted that. I knew Jeff Buckley. Oh, J yeah, yeah well. tell me about Honky Tonk Woman. Did you work with him? <laughs> <laughs> God, that was yeah. in L.A., right? Yeah, it was in L.A. That's scary. Yeah, he, he was really good friends with a friend of mine named Michael Klaus. And so when I first moved to L.A., I heard about uh, Jeff straight away. And uh, we were kind of doing sessions for a couple of the same people. And pe people said to me, the first time I heard his name, they said, Wow, you sound a lot like Jeff Buckley. And I was like, okay. You know, mentally clocked that. Right. And uh, then I sort of heard him, and then I sort of met him, and it was like in... Uh, you know, it's constantly sort of playing on the same songs and, and crossing paths. And then uh, one, one day we were hanging out in the studio and we did a, a really bad version of Honky Talk Woman. And he was doing like Keith Richards, a really bad you know, English <laughs> accent. You know, and he, he taught me how the, the riff to Honky Talk Woman, you know, and he was like singing it. And uh, it was pretty funny. So, so was he big then? No. It was, he wasn't big then. No, you know, people didn't even know he sang back then. He was, like, he was, he was very kind of, you know, very kind of quiet guy with a lot going on in his head and obviously very talented you know and it seemed he always seemed slightly tortured or like there was some sort of you know he had a he had a, a you know a line of defense you know what I mean he was always kind of a little bit back even though he was charismatic he was sort of withdrawn and and then he moved to New York you know he moved to New he York moved to New York and then all of a sudden you know a series of events bam 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 and then whoosh. and you you left Wichita and came to LA yeah. Martina went the other way why did you come to LA you know, being from the Midwest, the weather is so cold, it's so hot, <laughs> oh, come on. it's so humid, you know. <laughs> but I, you guys were pretty talented there. There was a lot of talent there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talent in the Midwest. I mean, musicians from where I'm from, you know, they're, they're really serious players. So why come here? You know, I thought, the one, the weather was, it was you know, I thought, was wow. It? Yeah, the beach, it's nice, it's sunny every day. And, it, you know, it seemed more, New York has that kind of, there's that saying uh, that New Yorkers, you know, uh, uh, L.A. people will stab you in the back and New Yorkers will stab you in the front. Oh, they yeah. right to your face, right? Yeah, and I, I just kind of thought, you know, L.A. seems a little bit more welcoming. You know, you could come in here and people are very positive. They're like, wow, man, you're really talented. You know, let me introduce you to my friend. You know, he's doing mm. this, he's doing that. We do that a lot, don't we? And that, I think L.A. is very good. different in that yeah. respect. I'm, I've never been any other places like that. Okay, then now, then you left L.A. and you went to London. I'm still trying to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not working. Here. I'll go did, over there. Did some some unhappiness happen in London? Um, you mean in L.A. or no, in London or was it in L.A. that sent you to London or what was it? You know, it? I was here for seven years and I loved it for the first four, four or five, and then I started. You know, you kind of go through the wormhole and you come out the other side, and and um, you know, the, the the charm of it starts to wear off a little bit, and then you're just there, and then you just um. you're, you're grafting. 
Okay, and, so. Uh, and the opportunity came to move to London. I got offered a record deal in London. Ah. Uh. And so, I, and they wanted me to come over. So I said, great, you know, I got somebody that's going to pay for me to come to London. <laughs> they, they're they're going to pay for all my stuff to be taken over there. <laughs> they're going to get me a place to live. I'm like, couldn't pass that done. And you've been there ever since because yeah. no one would pay to bring you yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. I said, you know, I can't, I can't afford to fly all my stuff back. It costs too much money. <laughs> So but when you were in London, you, I'm you, 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 on an island. you did get a you did get a deal. But what was the Mark Jones Wall of Sound thing? That, went, that happened about three years after I was there. I had this deal with another label, and that went nowhere. That was kind of a three-year stint, uh -huh. and it ended with the record not being released. And then I spent uh -huh. like another few years, kind of in the wilderness, reinventing myself and just kind of getting my craft together and just kind of dealing really with Really working, huh? Yeah, you know, because when you go through that whole process of finally getting that big record deal and it kind of goes sour and you, have, you don't have a lot of control over it and, uh, and then, you know, that really it kind of ha can be a bit soul-destroying. And uh, so it took me a while to get my head together and lick my wounds and kind of, you know, put myself back out there again and then the deal with Wall of Sound happened. And, and you were a flagship artist. What I does was. that mean? I was the first, they, they started an offshoot label called We Love You, and which was meant to be a slightly different kind of label because they, they were more dance orientated. Uh, and uh, I so see. they thought, let's, have, let's uh, have like a more musical label with people that write songs. And, I got it. And so, yeah, so here I am, I come in and uh, it was a similar scenario to the first record deal I had in London. It was more of a dance oriented label and I was more of a singer songwriter and it was the first time they'd, you know, dealt with that kind of artist and obviously they don't know, they don't know quite how to do it. So if you do, if it's a dance oriented, are you playing instruments? I'm playing instruments. I was always that kind of guy that understood like, the kind of beats and all that, uh -huh. but I was also a musician and a songwriter. And what did you play? What instruments do you play? Well, I play uh, anything I can get my hands on. But really? I, yeah, some, some, of, some of these things quite badly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm creative, so I'll find a way to get a sound, to find a, find a part, find something which inspires me. But I, I suppose guitar, bass, drums, Percussion, I'm pretty even on all those, pretty accomplished. And then, then I'll play, I play keyboards and um, lots of different stringed instruments. Just, I'll just pick something up and... And, and you'll uh, be a part of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think once you understand the language of music, you know, you can kind of get by. If you know, like, certain, it's like when you go to a foreign country, if you know a few phrases, they can yeah. kind of get you by a bit mm -hmm. and you can kind of facilitate, you know, things that you need to do. Um, you started the Ping Pong Orchestra, which is what, like, who is this guy? Ping Pong Orchestra, what does this mean? Well, I think it has a couple it's of different... It's such a great name. <laughs> what? And then you're going like, PPO. Yeah, oh well, yeah. <laughs> you gotta have a name that you can abbreviate and sounds good. That's, <laughs> that was the first thing I did, I was writing things on a piece of paper. And yeah, so, uh, that, that when you're writing, that's what I was gonna ask you. What instrument do you use? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, you know, I like to change it up because I find um, uh, when I start a track on one instrument, I get a very different result. So if I start on drums, then it's going to be, you know, the, all the music's going to be based around a groove. But if I start on with chords on either guitar or piano, then it might be more mood-based, to be more melodic. Ah. Um, so, you know, I just like to switch it up. And sometimes you play one instrument better than others, so that one idea might be slightly more naive. So it really depends on what you're using and the music that comes out that you're exactly. writing. Exactly, because I write a lot of music, so I like to, I like to you know, vary it, so it keeps it very interesting and fresh. You're, you do a lot of TV shows. They've used your tracks. That's do you right. write specifically for a TV show, or do they just I haven't done your work? I haven't done yet. They, they normally source you know, records that I put out, and they, they like a song, and they'll put it into a film I or see, a TV I or see. a commercial. But I, I do compose specifically for things as well. But um, how many ping pong albums? Is this one? That is actually just a Sean Lee record, which is the latest record. Oh, and this is Sean Lee. Yeah, not Sean Lee's ping pong orchestra, but just Sean Lee. Just Sean Lee. Okay. 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 Um, and what about ping pong orchestra? Ping pong orchestra, I think there's seven albums so far. That's a lot. Yeah. Did you write all the music? I did, yeah. I mean, on the vocal, on this record here, it's collaborative, and there's different singers on every song. I'm singing a couple of tracks. So I'm writing the music generally on those songs, and the singers writing their lyrics and their melodies. With ping pong, PPO, yeah, PPO what kind right. of sound is that? You know, the, PP, the ping pong orchestra started off really to be an instrumental project, which was very sort of cinematic. So uh, mm -hmm. it's very kind of like atmospheric and mood-based and textural. Uh, whereas like the Sean Lee records tend to have more vocals and they're more song orientated but then you know there are sort of instrumentals sometimes on Sean Lee records and sometimes there's vocal tracks on ping, ping pong orchestra records so they cross over a bit. Ping pong on ping, 
on ping pong. Have people tried to copy that sound? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, there's definitely been a, a bit of that. I mean, basically what I'm doing, I'm, it's, it's a lot of it's my love for old school, you know, film and TV music, oh, uh -huh. and incidental music. So is it like kind of stuff. grand? Yeah, there's some tracks that are very epic, and some tracks that are very kind of intimate and simple. I mean, it runs the gamut. Because I do so many records and so many songs, then I'm sort of like, there's, you know, there's lots of different <laughs> sort of areas to, to delve into. Um, but yeah, it's just, a lot of times I'm sort of, I'm, you know, copying like Morricone or... Oh, I see. Or, oh, or, oh, like, like that. Like so it's kind of like, it's like how art works. It's like, you know, you're, you're feeding off somebody else's creativity right. and adding your own I spin it. on it. And then somebody hears your thing and you inspire them. And then they're doing a version of your thing and on it goes, you know. Yeah. Affinity. It's... <laughs> it's um, an homage to yeah. Lalo Schifrin and yeah. Tamara Coney. There's certainly, there's some songs which are just completely like, you know, I'm, I'm so picking up where they, where they left off. Yeah. You know, it's like, but you they, know. Don't have any, they don't have any vocals, yeah. mostly. And what, what, how do you sing? How do you sound? Uh, I, I have a very soulful voice. I mean, a lot of times people think I'm black when I sing. Okay, so, let's, know, I, like how? Give uh, me a little. Um, well, I just couldn't sing now. I'd be like, you know, say, say strip off your clothes and be naked. I'd be like, oh, my God. You can't do that. <laughs> too intense, you know. Please don't do that. Yeah, well, you know, that's another show. Uh, this is a family audience. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm into really classic kind of soul singers like Al Green and... Uh, oh, I see. And Marvin Gaye. And, and that, that kind of voice thing. comes through? Yeah, it's very natural. I mean, I've been, I think, you know, the way you talk when, you, when you're from a place, you learn... Yeah. to speak that way and the accent is sort of natural thing that you, your ear picks up on and then you just do it and I think with singing it's very similar you you what you listen to influences uh, the way you sing and then, then it becomes you imitate people and then you imitate lots of different people and through that process you know you become yourself you find your own voice that's fantastic and then you don't think about it anymore you just do it you just do it yeah. Sean thank you so much thank you, I know you're on a short visit from London and we really appreciate your coming to the studio. I uh, appreciate you having me here. Thank you. Keep writing. J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.